Coming up on Nebraska Stories, tossing out modern clubs for antique irons. A Sudanese refugee shares her story of hope, overcoming challenges to achieve greatness, and a visit to the duck pin bowling lanes of Potter. the winning Hickory International Cup team for the U.S. of A. Brown and friends hope their spoons, mashies, and niblicks carry them to victory. The whip of the gunny down the fairway, and off they go. In motorized golf carts in suburban Omaha, past meets present in the world of Hickory golf. Well, Hickory golf uh, kind of brings us back to our roots of the way the golf was back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Brown's an orthopedic surgeon and avid golfer who discovered this different way of playing the sport a few years ago and was quickly hooked. Part of the fascination is just uh, the idea of golf history and what, what uh, the previous uh, great players were, Bob Jones, Walter Hagen, Harry Varden. So many of us started out as golf collectors. We'd collect clubs and we'd collect old golf balls. And then, uh, and then one thing led to another and pretty soon we were trying to play these sticks. My favorite club, the one I will not give up, I have a Benny. It's oh, yeah. White. But that's, the Benny has like a little different it's notch so out of the, the head. Mm -hmm. Those are neat. Some of the clubs they talk about are a century old with names like Mashy and Niblick. Today, they're being used in a small, low-key hickory golf competition between teams from two Omaha courses. Most dressed for the event in the style of hickory-era golfers. They're fun to wear. You know, it's funny, sometimes when you dress up, you play better. The eight players also share similar stories of passionate golfers looking to the past for a new challenge. Hap Pachris once wore a college golf uniform. Golf just kind of got a little stale for me here the last few years, and I was discouraged because I wasn't able to compete like I wanted to. I was introduced to Hickory Golf, and uh, at first I turned my nose to it like most until I finally tried it, and I was hooked pretty much immediately. Probably just the history of the game, um, how good it feels to hit a hickory shot, um, playing with your buddies, uh, sharing clubs, trading clubs, finding the clubs. Hickory players are a small fraction of the 25 million who play the sport in the United States. But while the overall number is said to be declining, those around Hickory Golf say interest in their version is growing. Ten years ago, nobody was playing hickory, and now we'll have 10 or 12 guys. And it's pretty common in many of the private clubs around town where um, you know, guys, typically more mature guys like myself, that'll play these old sticks just for a, a different w method of, uh, of golf play. 41.8 or thereabouts. And that interest has helped spur a little growth industry in Omaha. Well, I am heating up the gutta percha material. Joe Manley retired from teaching music. Now he makes balls for McIntyre Golf. Dave Brown started the small company, which makes golf balls like those that were played in the Hickory era. In this case, the pre-1905 Gutty. The recipe starts with cooking the tree-based raw material in 180 degree water. So there are people who collect them, there's people who play with them, and there are people who play with modern clubs that just think it's cool to have a mesh pattern ball rather than just a boring old modern ball. 
And for another basically one-person operation, Ray Shuneman sold his 20-year business, learned blacksmithing, and started making putters by hand. No one has done this, as far as I'm aware, for probably 85 years. And I read a couple books on it, and I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if I can do it. Okay. It starts with a chunk of steel in a 2,300-degree forge, then a couple thousand wax with a heavy hammer. rewarding work. I mean, it's physical work, but it's mentally rewarding and phew, voila, you have something at the end. You take a bar of steel and you turn it into something like this. This is just the beginning of a, of a golf club. Oops. Playing with the old equipment can be challenging. You don't make a good swing and the uh, bad shots are a lot worse. Magnified a hundred times. Yep. So you just have to accept it and move on and forget about it. These players also use modern clubs at times. The difference, they say, is just a few strokes and some distance, especially off the tee. But if you get your their shafts right, the wooden shafts right, you can swing them just like a regular swing. I do anyway. In a modern era plentiful with swing experts and high-tech analysis, Pakras says hickory golf is more about keeping things simple. With the hickory golf and the and the style of play that you that you that you partake with with uh, with hickory golf the shafts are built in a way that it's it's really very much feel uh, and what I mean by that is is you know closing your eyes and swinging a club and just getting a sense of where the club is at all times and that feel there is what's most important it's also about how they feel when using century-old equipment and clothing to be able to bring these old e clubs and this old equipment into play uh, it, it, it absolutely draws you the connection, it draws that connection to, to where the, the game began and why we're here enjoying it today. I think it's because it, it connects people to the history, to the long history. There's not many sports, you know, archery and horse riding and so forth that have a five, six hundred year history. So to be able to connect to that as a participant of any activity or sport, I think is pretty special. It feels a lot different. It's great, actually. I come out here and if I, a bad hickory day is, is still a, a really, really good golf day. And you can always blame this old golf club for the bad shot. And a good walk unspoiled by taking a few steps back in time. This is a Okra. That's okra with the, some vegetable and spices and beef. The aroma of beef. garlic, cumin, and other spices fills every corner of this house as a Ben Kucha tier cooks her favorite Sudanese dishes for friends and family. Yeah, I need to leave some food for the boys at least for a uh, few days so they will not miss me a lot. I'm traveling. <laughs> Tomorrow, Aben leaves for a trip to Australia, where she will see her baby sister for the first time in 23 years. She's making sure the house is well stocked with her son's favorite dishes while she's gone. But this is no vacation for this Sudanese refugee, who has been in the U.S. since 1994 and in Lincoln for the last 10 years. The real purpose of the trip is to share her story of survival during the Sudanese Civil War that began in the 80s. She spent 11 years fleeing the violence with her kids in tow, losing her husband, brother, and a daughter, among so many others, along the way. This is my husband, a picture of my husband. I did not have his picture until I came to U.S. here. It was nice for the kids because they, they didn't know their father, how he looked like. They were very young. When I imagine where we came from, 
just running, running, running from under the tree to under the tree, from refugees camp to a refugees camp, from starvation to starvation, from death to death. This is all you see all the time, hearing sounds of big gun machine all the time. That was the life within these 11 years. And you don't know when you will get out of it or when you will die. Sometimes I, I, I tell myself, why am I still alive? Why are we still alive? It's a miracle. This is me. I am grounding corn flour, make it into a food with, with, between the stones. That's what we used to use in refugees camp. She's proud of her heritage, her homeland, and her family. And this is our family picture that was taken in 2006 in Minnesota and Rochester. So this is at home, my daughter, the lawyer, my lawyer, yeah. She even self-published a book as a promise to her son with a message for others. Everything that happened to me, I decided not to look at what happened, but to look for what will happen, hoping that things will change. So it's a message of hope. Good afternoon, class. How are you? I'm speaking to my Sudanese community, especially the women. Women are so behind in Sudan. Who would even give a woman a chance to speak in front of people? No, there is no that kind of chances. But here, I can stand in front of people now and speak. But I'm extremely proud of my mom and my sister and my brother, you know. It's just, it's amazing, it's inspiring. I'm, I'm at the point right now, after I've seen everything she's done, I'm ready to go back to school. I'm ready to find my calling. Her story is like powerful. Like it, it can impact people. Like it's a it's a good message. Yeah, it's a good message. Like even like at like when you're at the brink of losing hope, there's still there's still always hope. Part of the proceeds of the book help fund donations to the widows and orphans of South Sudan. <laughs> she visited her home village of Bor earlier this year, bringing with her clothing, food, and hygiene supplies. All right, hey there, Lincoln, and everyone listening on the World Wide Web. Welcome to the Joy Factor. And My back home, children. she's sharing and her story on the radio. In the, in the past few years, she's accepted most any invitation to share her unique message of hope, hitting several states and countries. As we ran, we came to the river, a very dangerous place. And now Saturday, she's preparing to be a featured speaker at a TEDx event. We came to the river, a very dangerous place. She's working with a coach who can help her condense an 11-year journey of miraculous survival into just a few minutes. Uh, I watched in despair. I watched in the despair. I'm covering 11 years in 12 minutes. That's what makes it difficult. This is a life story. Yeah, it's making me very nervous. I mean, it was so amazing to work with, you know. I mean, her heart is just so full and so passionate. Um, I don't think I've met a stronger woman. This is very different and very nervous. I'm very nervous about it. This time, it is different. The nerves are heightened. Perhaps it's the venue, the weeks of preparation, or the event itself. TEDx Lincoln is the local nonprofit inspired by the worldwide TED Talks conferences, featuring motivating speakers, thinkers, and doers, sharing ideas in person and live streamed worldwide. I'm nervous and at the same time I'm excited too because in my heart I I like to share it so people would know what other people have gone through and how it can help to give them hope. Please give our last TEDx Lincoln welcome to Aben Mathayo Kucha. Thousands of people were calling for their loved ones. Panic was everywhere, and it continued throughout the night. I finally found my children. We would be moving together as family. I had hope. Good. 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 Good.
She did amazing, and she did exactly what we wanted her to do, is end the day helping us all remember all the things we have to be grateful for and how hard people work to have the world that we live in. Beautiful. Thank you. Each time she tells the story, it can be empowering, but also deeply emotional. Phenomenal story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. You're a strong woman. Thank you. That never go away, and it will never go away. That's how I feel about it. It's something I've been through. There's a loss in there. There's a faith in it. There's many things involved in it that will bring tears to me and to everybody who heard about it. But it's still a story of hope because we are still here and my children are happy. Jobs are hard to get, I know. People looking for work all the time, they can't find work. I had an interview somewhere, can't remember where it was, and then I know what the problem was. It's, it, it, oh, it's my disability. People got disability and they don't hire people. People with a, a handicap, they don't. You gotta talk to Jane, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta walk, that's five miles from your house. Oh, I need exercise. And it was a citizen advocacy program well, where you pair up yeah. And the words we used at the time were advocate and protege. We're just friends, and we've been friends for 35 years. Everybody in here that has known Steve, he's he's like family to all of us. He's uh, simply Mr. Mr. Reliable. Steve is a man of routines, so he gets here every day about four o'clock, and I think. He's happy to come here because this is a, a place he's been coming to for so long and he knows all the people here. Well, good morning, Cliff. Uh, I think we kind of kind of hit it off and we've had a good rapport ever since. We both like to kind of tease each other and we've got that built up over about nine years, so it's a, it's a rich experience, I guess. Do you think the show's good enough that they're gonna make a second season? Well, I hope they do. He has a good character, he has a good attitude, and I'm proud to know the guy. You know, I'm proud to kind of share an hour every day with him and to be a part of his routine and ha to have him as a part of our routine. It, it can be pouring, it can be 10 below zero or 100 degrees and Steve walks every morning to work. Uh, he reports I think around 5.15. It, it doesn't matter. He's going to get here one way or another. I think that's remarkable given Nebraska's winters especially and uh, uh, blizzards and so forth, but he makes it through and he's here and he's on time and he's not ruffled and the rest of us are, have uh, had to scoop our cars out of the snow and so forth and it's sort of a, uh, a, a nice feeling to come in and everything is kind of on the even keel with Steve. I'm going, oh boy, what happened here? If everyone in this building had his work ethic, um, they would, they would get so much more work done. He doesn't stop. You can't get him to take a break. He wants to be here. I think this is his family, this, this building and the people that work in this building that he's known for years are part of his family. And, and I'm happy to be one of those. Hopefully I've been that for Steve, someone he can always count on. I can't say there's anything I said or did that helped him out. I think if anything did, it was a Goodwills program that enabled him to be independent, have his own apartment, uh, not be on any public benefits, um, and have a retirement account and all those things that go along, having his own apartment, getting his own groceries, living his own life independently as he wants to live. That's done most of it. I really do think if it weren't for Goodwill is the one constant in his life over the, over the 35 years, 37 years I've known him that has enabled him to to get where he is at now. The Goodwill Industries International Achiever of the Year Award, and that means international, worldwide. The joy that you have brought to all of us and the inspiration you've brought to all of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. He sort of realized that what he was doing was really good stuff for us. And, uh, we're all happy that he's receiving this kind of recognition. 
and out of 500 applicants, 500 people applied for that, for that award as the Achiever of the Year. And Steve was the one that got it because of his history and where he began and where he ended up and his accomplishments over the years. That was quite a moment for Steve where you're in front of 500 people and you're up on the microphone. And so uh, we had kind of written a speech out ahead of time. And he said, Jim, can you read it? Steve is, is shy, um, a little shy, but in addition to being such a good worker, so committed, having such a high level of, of common sense and integrity, Steve also is good at dictation, at, at giving dictation. And so Steve asked if we would say this, basically. <laughs> Everybody in the room gave up and gave him a standing ovation. And it was just a highlight of his life. And it was just all you could do to keep from bust, busting into tears. It was just a really neat moment for him. For as far as he's come, as lonely he's, as he's been, to be there and, and, and receive that kind of inspirational accolade. It was a wonderful thing to see. You don't realize the time goes by, then all of a sudden the time's gone by, and you've been friends for nearly 40 years. Okay, Something I, I inexplicable, but when you sit down in a room with him and talk with him for a few moments, you know, and get past a bit of the shyness, then you discover this is one really neat guy who just brightens up everybody's life. Um, and it's, it's really hard to put into words um, the why. Other than that, I think he's a joyful guy because he gives joy. The people in the village of Potter say they can tell the strength of America's economy by how often the trains roll by town. Word is that trains are running every 15 minutes, which means things are clicking along pretty good. Most of these little towns are, they're falling apart. Potter has actually grown a little bit, and, uh, and that's because of the, the people that we have in town. People like Kirk Anna Volson, a fourth generation banker, whose great grandfather opened the first bank in Potter in 1908. Kirk is also the chairman of the Potter Historical Foundation. The main goal of the foundation is to preserve and enhance the, the central business district. The goal is to not have one building that's boarded up. As of this minute, we don't have one building that's boarded up. The foundation was founded in 2000 when a former resident bought, restored, and then donated the Potter Sundry back to the community. He wanted to have every child in Potter have the same experience he had, be, be able to grow up and come down to the Sundry after school and have a dinner of Sunday or, or soda or whatever. We have two places to eat, really. In this town, we have you know, the bar or the Sundry, so if one place is closed, you kind of hope that another one is open. The town proudly promotes the sundry as the home of the Tin Roof Sunday. That's our story and we're sticking to it, so. The first thing is a, a vanilla ice cream and then a uh, chocolate syrup and then uh, chocolate ice cream and then real marshmallow on top and peanuts on top of that. Tasty. Dale may have earned the money to buy his ice cream by working as a pin setter at the Potter Duck Pin Bowling Lanes. Duck pin bowling is played with a six inch bowling ball that has no finger holes. There's nothing electronic about this game. Everything is done manually. I'd get a nickel a line, so that was pretty good money back then. four guys were bowling on that line, they would get 20 cents during the whole game, so. And I just remember some of the guys threw really hard and the guy that ran the place would holler at them to quit throwing so hard you're gonna kill my pin setter, so. <laughs> the antique bowling lanes sit on the second floor of what used to be the old hardware store. Kirk's family bought the building in 2000 and renovated it 
with the help of city volunteers. We wouldn't get half this stuff done without the great people in Potter and the Potter community. It's said Potter has the only duck pin bowling alley west of the Mississippi River. Well, I remember the, the league nights would, uh, and they had one or two nights, I think Fridays and Saturdays, league play, and this place would be overflowed. It was pretty wild around here. Uh, you could hardly, you know, get them down the stairs, so. Frozen in time, the team roster board still lists the leagues that played in 1951, just before the bowling alley was closed. Today, the bowling lanes are rented out for parties. $25 an hour, and it's pretty much run on the honor system. So we've asked that when you rent this, that you leave it in the same condition that you found it. And so far, we've had pretty good luck with that. As long as trains are rolling by, it appears the village of Potter will continue to thrive. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories. And go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation, the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Tourism Commission, and First Nebraska Bank. Sustained funding for arts coverage is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gendler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and Nebraska Cultural Endowment.